Oh, man, there was so much controversy and drama behind this record. Uh, the backstory of this rock epic it reached like the front page of the National Enquirer. But at first, the song was only a minute long, and musically, it was kind of boring. It would take a producer's secret mission and a fair amount of subterfuge to turn this track into the monster anthem that it is today. It's the tale of one of the most controversial songs ever to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100, and it came from a very real place. You're not going to believe just how controversial it really was. The story is coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember reading the ridiculous headlines on the National Enquirer or uh, what was it called? The Weekly World News. You know, when you were standing in the line at the grocery store with your parents growing up. You're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Jump in the time machine every single day. Make sure to subscribe below. Hit the big red button. Click the bell so you always know uh, when our newest interviews and videos come out. Also, consider checking out our Patreon and joining it. Uh, help our mission of keeping this music alive. You know, the mid to late 70s were kind of a rough time artistically for rock acts, you know, that didn't make dance records, that is. I mean, from 1974 to 1979, the conventional wisdom was you either jumped on uh, the disco bandwagon or you don't have any hits or get major radio play. So to stay hot in the scene, many of the biggest names in rock and roll succumbed to the pressure and... Uh, they created music with a disco beat. I mean, Rod Stewart had a huge number one, Do You Think I'm Sexy? Stones had Miss You. Of course, Kiss, the band that taught us how to rock. Uh, they had uh, I Was Made for Loving You. Some people liked him, some people didn't. many other headliners, Elton John, Paul McCartney, and even Queen, they also dabbled in the genre. But perhaps the most shocking and incredulous incorporation of disco ever was when the Paragon of Prog Rock, Pink Floyd, recorded today's featured song, Another Brick in the Wall, Part 2. Pink Floyd, of course, comprised a guitar genius David Gilmore, bassist and conceptual genius Roger Waters, uh, drummer Nick Mason, and keyboardist Rick Wright, began the recording sessions for Waters' autobiographical masterpiece, The Wall, in December of 1978, right in the middle of disco. Really, disco was at its peak. Disco was a sound buzzing in the streets and the dance beat that devoured the nightclubs, which makes the enormous success of The Wall all that much more impressive. The Wall, we've covered a few times on here, some of the songs from it. Uh, it tells the story of Waters' semi-fictional protagonist, Pink. Uh, to give you a little rundown, beginning with his traumatic post-war English childhood and culminating with a harrowing a psychological standoff with all the pain he's endured in his life. Uh, when Pink was a young boy, his father died in combat during World War II. Enough to damage even the strongest soul. Pink searches for ways to cope with this stark reality. His childhood grows even darker under the care of a smothering mother and the reign of cruel and despotic schoolmasters. And then later as an adult, Pink becomes a disillusioned hedonistic rock star caught up in a failing marriage. Decades of mental and emotional trauma come to head when Pink discovers his wife has been unfaithful to him. Uh, which, of course, triggers a complete mental breakdown. In response to life's unrelenting disappointments and hardships, Pink constructs a psychological wall, really, to separate himself from the pain, from everything else. Every heart-rending event, every disappointment, every agonizing incident from his childhood, uh, it's represented by, of course, the bricks for the wall. Part prisoner or part escapee, Pink's coping strategy and defense mechanisms catch up with him and culminate in a psychological confrontation with his ego once that uh, wall is complete. Contained within the totality of this epic double album rock opera, there's another rock opera in miniature that I want to focus on today. 
course, the three-part Another Brick in the Wall anthology, which revolves around the self-exploration of the wall's thesis. Each Brick in the Wall song uh, further severs uh, Pink from the world, marking both the beginning and the concluding moments of the wall's construction. In part one, young Pink begins his uh, metaphorical build with the deep-seated trauma caused by his father's death, who is now only a memory, a scrapbook snapshot in a family photo album. The disappearance of Pink's father lays the foundation for a lifetime of cognitive anguish. It's the first of many bricks to come. Snapshot in the family album. According to Roger Waters, the song is addressed not only to those who have lost a father in war, but to all children who cope with the absence of a parent at all. He said, and I quote, It is personal for me, but it's also meant to be about any family where either parent goes away for whatever reason. Pink's childhood suffering reaches agonizing heights as he is thrown to the domineering and abusive actions of his schoolmasters. A sandwich between Another Brick Parts 1 and 2 is something of a preamble for the latter, the happiest days of our lives. This track, of course, summarizes Pink's scholastic years in all of its bitter agony and primes a revolt of Another Brick in the Wall Part 2. When we grew up and went to school, there were certain teachers who would hurt the children in any way they could. Like much of the wall, Roger Waters drew from personal experiences for this specific track, and a lot of it. Based on his years at the Cambridgeshire uh, School for Boys, he came away despising his grammar school teachers, who were more concerned with you know, making the kids compliant than actually educating. Pink recounts how his teachers stopped at nothing to erase individuality and really humiliate the students. And in a quiet moment of sadistic revenge, he imagines his teachers going home to be abused themselves by their psychopathic wives who trashed them to within inches of life itself. And then in Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, Pink launches his rebellion, declaring, we don't need no education. And here, Roger Waters, uh, he's not condemning the pursuit of knowledge, of course, but rather the cruel means by which children were taught. Thought control. Dark sarcasm? Yeah, that's pretty messed up. We don't need no education. Pink shout of protest, teachers leave them kids alone. It's a rallying cry. It's a revolt against an establishment that wanted to create cogs for the national machine. Then as if to punctuate just how villainous these teachers were, we hear Pink's schoolmaster yelling at the track's conclusion, if you don't eat your meat, you can't have any pudding. How can you have any pudding if you don't eat your meat? I mean, it's absolutely chilling. After the passage of six more tracks, we arrive at another Brick of the Wall Part 3, nearly marking the halfway point of the Wall saga. In this short 1 minute and 15 second track, Pink is now an adult, you know, with his dreaded school days long behind him. Moreover, he's now a rock star, living with all the decadent trappings that come with fame. After discovering his wife has been unfaithful to him, like I said, Pink has an all-out psychological breakdown. Triggered by the news, he completely isolates himself and he puts the last brick in the wall. I don't need no arms around me and I don't need no drugs to calm me. I've seen the writing on the wall. Don't think I need anything at all. Pink then dehumanizes everyone in his life, relegating them to just bricks in the wall. Again, this music, it's devastatingly chilling. Um, rejected and wounded, Pink believes his wall is his only protection from this pain. But all he's done is really exile himself to a perverse prison of self-punishment. So let's return to another Brick of the Wall Part 2. Uh, and we'll pull back the curtain just a little bit more. Now, when producer Bob Ezrin came on board for the wall, he took up the challenge to give this album-oriented band a hit song on the singles chart. 
Any Pink Floyd fan knows this. I mean, a counterintuitive approach for one of the world's foremost progressive rock bands. But this found um, less resistance than you might expect. Um, as we get into that, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eye, with the glasses I always wear. Right now, you can get transition light intelligent lenses. Uh, they go from light to dark when you go outside. Illuminate your look with new colors. There's emerald, amber, and graphite green. You're going to love it. Just click uh, on our info button right up here to get our best price. Try it today. Now, although Pink Floyd clearly didn't like disco per se, they had no problem with incorporating a more funky 100 speed per minute backing in several of their songs, just like Queen did with another one, Bites of Dust, came out about a year or so later. At first, Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 was just Roger Waters singing over an acoustic guitar. Uh, Waters imagined it as a simple track for the album, just a verse and a basic chorus, then just a guitar solo fade. All in all is just another brick in the wall. The first recording of the track was only about a minute and 20 seconds. Kind of boring. Um, but Bob Ezrin, he implored the band to lengthen it by just adding a verse and another chorus. Now, initially, they refused. But Ezrin persisted. He told them that if they allowed him to extend the track, Another Brick of the Wall Part 2, it could be a massive hit. And part one of his plan was to disco it, if you will. Roger answered Bob with a glib remark, go ahead and waste your time doing silly stuff. <laughs> like Queen's John Deacon and many other industry tastemakers, Ezrin, he was fascinated by disco. Generally, the music of Sheik in particular, can't really blame him. I mean, Sheik's co-leader, Niall Rogers, and Bernard Edwards made a stack of seriously irresistible dance tracks. I guess Ezrin heard Sheik's music when he was visiting New York City, and he had an epiphany of what to do with another brick in the wall. Uh, we previously mentioned this uh, briefly on another program, but to somehow Bob Ezrin convinced David Gilmore to visit a couple of clubs, disco clubs, and you know, listen to what was happening in the disco music scene. Visibly disgusted, Gilmore forced himself to check out some discotheques and those funky grooves. <laughs> he thought the music was awful, as it was said, but when he came back to the studio, he admitted that Ezra was onto something here, and he wrote a catchy guitar riff to anchor an entirely new arrangement. Really made the song come alive. You know what, but even then, uh, Bob Ezrin wasn't done uh, wasting his time with silly stuff. He actually had a secret plan. He waited until the band left the studio and clandestinely set to work extending the track. Now, his idea was to use uh, school-age children to reprise the verse and chorus that Waters had written. Ezrin tasked engineer Nick Griffiths with uh, tracking down some kids to record the parts. Under the gun, Griffiths scouted out Islington Green School. It was located just blocks from the studio. Islington was a struggling English comprehensive school in a rough part of North London. And though it was certainly not renowned for uh, the arts, per se, it was about to go down in recorded history. Now, Nick approached the school's unorthodox but extremely popular music teacher, a guy named Alan Ranshaw. Uh, more than likely, Anybody else would have been appalled by Griffith's proposition. But Renshaw, he was different. He was a bit of a maverick. And he thought the lyrics, we don't need no education, were great. He thought they were fabulous. But uh, he knew deep down that the schoolmaster, his boss, a lady named Margaret Maiden, wouldn't approve of this. So Renshaw covertly escorted 23 kids from the ages of 13 to 15 out of the school without permission. The kids recorded their vocals at the Britannia Row Studios, and then they stuck back into school. Afterwards, Renshaw admitted to Maiden what he had done, and uh, let's just say that she was not happy at all. When Another Brick on the Wall Part Two was released, neither Renshaw nor Maiden could have predicted the overwhelmingly negative reaction the lyrics would stir up against them and the school. Both educators were heavily criticized by the press. Um, they were just ripped apart. The lawyers for Pink Floyd's record label, they were pretty freaked out at this. They were scared that there would be legal repercussions for having a song on the record sung by uh, children who were so young. The drama got so intense that Bob Ezrin took the tapes home with him at the end of each shift. He feared that the label were going to confiscate them. 
And yet, Azrin and Griffiths knew their secret mission would yield amazing results, so they stayed the course. They overdubbed the vocals of the 23 children, uh, I think it was 12 times. You know, it gave the track the powerful sonic illusion of a much larger choir. Said Gilmore about it, originally we were gonna put them in the background, you know, behind Roger and me singing the same verse, but it was so good, we decided to do them on their own. It was a great move. When Ezra played the finished recording for the band, he was actually pleasantly surprised by their reaction. Gilmore thought the finished version sounded like a Pink Floyd song. And Waters, he was likewise impressed. When he heard the recording, he knew it was gonna be a really important song. I mean, you think about it, over the course of their phenomenal and abundant career, Pink Floyd didn't release a lot of commercial singles. At least it's not as much as they could have. I think they could have had so many hits. Uh, I mean, you know, of course there was money from Dark Side that reached number 13 on the Hot 173. In later years, Floyd scored some mainstream rock number ones off of a momentary lapse of reason and the division bell. That was the rock charts, not the pop charts. There were others, but you know, just for example, if you take a look at Floyd's 10 most streamed songs on Spotify right now, eight of them were never released as singles in America in any form. But if singles were rare, hit singles on the Billboard Hot 100 were all but non-existent. I mean, obviously Pink Floyd could care less about this. I mean, the band wanted their music to be appreciated in the context of their albums thematically. Most fans feel that way too, I know I do. We talked about this before, like I said, a greatest hits album for Pink Floyd makes very little sense. Still, in the case of Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, Ezrin managed to convince the band to release the song as a single. Hey, teacher, leave kids alone. It dropped on November 16th, 1979. And this uh, disco music track with a kid's choir, the extra verse and chorus, and all the elements that Waters called silly stuff, it actually worked perfectly. As you know, the song exploded worldwide. It sold over 4 million copies and it became Pink Floyd's solitary number one hit on the Hot 100. It likewise reached number one in the US Cashbox 100, topped the charts in France, Portugal, West Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Norway, Finland, Sweden, South Africa, Israel, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Ireland, and the UK worldwide. It proved that if Pink Floyd had wanted to be a singles band, they would have done just fine. They were hit makers if they wanted to. Still, Roger Waters, ever the pessimistic observer, made the following disapproving comment about it. Another brick in the wall really was another nail in my heart. Imagine people buying like sheep a record telling them not to let themselves be rounded up by collies. Hey, that's Roger Waters. Would you expect anything different? No Through the years, though, Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 has remained one of Pink Floyd's most popular songs. And although outside of the film version of The Wall, it hasn't been in any big movies, that's because I think it's so connected to The Wall. Uh, it's been covered by quite a few other bands. There's Portugal the Man. Hey, teacher, Hollywood Vampires, Corn, Nickelback, Maroon 5, Candlebox, uh, Roger Daltrey did it, Sister Hazel, 10,000 Maniacs. R.E.M. and Lenny Kravitz to name a few. Also worth noting is Alice Cooper blended another brick in the wall part two with his own rebellious education anthem, Schools Out. The merger of the two songs became a go-to mashup in many of his concerts. Truth is, Another Brick in the Wall Part 2 has been a fixture in my life for as long as I can remember. I mean, it's really maybe one of my first few memories. Definitely one of the first four or five songs I remember hearing as a child. It freaked me out. I mean, as a four-year-old kid, it was like the musical equivalent of first time I saw a horror movie. But as I grew older and I started to understand its meaning and its impact, I felt it even more. I remember, with the help of a few friends, sneaking a, you know, a boombox into a militant teacher's classroom and letting this track just play, just blast. Now, the boombox was confiscated and we were threatened as a class, but no one ever turned us in. It was our act of defiance against this teacher's iron rule. We don't 
What Roger Waters created clear back in the late 70s, I think it resonates even more today. It's a very simple phrase, but oh so powerful. We don't need no thought control. Leave us a comment about this revolutionary song and this album below. What are your memories of the first time that you heard it? What are your thoughts on Roger Waters and the impact of this song now? If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Till next time, three chords and the truth.